Jim part. As I kind of demonstrated, the wheeze is widespread and it's high pitched. It's, it's, uh, uh, there are multiple pitches. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it starts and stops at various points of the respiratory cycle and varying in tone and duration over time. And this is stemming from the fact that this wheezing, this noise is coming out of peripheral smaller airways and they are different calibers. So the speed of air that comes out of these different areas in the periphery are not the same. And therefore, they arrive to the vocal cords. So they arrive, the vocal cords is where the voice is happening. So they arrive to the vocal cords at different speeds, at a different time zones, different time, time, time constants. And therefore, the noise that you hear is polyphonic. It's rather diverse. Unlike the monophonic wheeze, that is basically high, it is low pitched, and it is a single sort of uh, 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 tone. And that is coming from a single pipe, that is the trachea or the subglottic area. And basically, it produces that single monophonic wheeze. That is not asthma. Asthma is polyphonic, high pitched, multi level. Variable from from uh, sometimes it's at the end of inspiration, uh, expiration, sometimes mid expiration, sometimes it's the pan expiratory, depending on how tight it is, and so on. So I uh, mean, you know, we don't want to dwell too much into this because it will take a long time just to go through this. And anyways, we will we will we will learn a lot more as we move on. Right. So the the, the wheezing suggests airway constriction, but it's not does not predict severity. So the, the so the most severe asthma attack actually they have silent chest, they don't have much because there is much not much air movement therefore the noise is is not there, uh, so and but that is that is very severe. Play. Uh, the other thing is that in severe asthma there are a few signs that we look at look look for but they are not too sensitive either. To keep near tachycardia prolonged expiratory phase of respiration. Uh, they, in the in the most severe cases, they would be seated in their positions. They are unable to go, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, beyond supine position. They feel so short of breath. They use accessory muscles, and this is where we call increased work of breathing. They are working hard to breathe. The other thing in adults and older children and adults, what, what we call pulses paradoxicus. They and this is something that basically uh, in physical examination, we see that the, the difference between systolic and diastolic pressure is sort of flip flop. And that is because of the intrathoracic pressure difference that happens because of air trapping. Anyways, let's move on. Any questions so far before we move on to the asthma mimickers? Yes, Dr. Janahi, thank you so much. Uh, we have two questions. Uh, first of one regarding the prevalence on Qatar and the region. So we can see we have a high prevalence comparing to other regions. Uh, do we have really a reason why we have um, high prevalence on Qatar? Um, the, the, the paper that uh, we published in 20, 2006, basically we pre in, in that paper we predicted that there is, there is, first of all, there is a high genetic predisposition because of the uh, consanguinity in, in marriages. Most of the, more than 50% of the marriages in Qatar are consanguous. Now, th that is more relevant to mono mon monogenic diseases. While asthma is not a monogenic disease, that's a polygenic disease in addition to it is there is a lot of environmental factors as well. So therefore, all those environmental exposures might play a role if you are genetically pre predisposed to have asthma. Now, the fact that we have high level of consanguinity, that means that there is a lot of this prevalence of, of, of genes that code for different A2Ps they are more prevalent to start with. The other thing is that there are many environmental factors that affect. So in another, in another paper, we also published, we also looked at what are the environmental factors that, that what are the allergens in the environment? There are multiple uh, papers that came out of the region. It says that we, we have uh, what we call uh, in uh, alternaria alternaria. It's, it's a very common allergen that is there in, in, in our air here. Uh, humidity, dust. Um, and then and then we, we talk about uh, uh, the different viruses. Now in children, viruses are more important than all the other factors. All the other factors are more important for the classic asthmatic adult and adolescent, while in infants, the most biggest trigger of asthma is actually viral illnesses. So one of the reasons is that prevalence of this consanguinity, but also uh, uh, the, the environment that we live in. Those are all uh, sort of uh, theories, uh, uh, speculations, none of this has been actually pinpointed that there is a direct relationship, cause and effect relationship. 
Great. Thank you so much. And we have another question speaking of uh, wheezing trajectory. Yeah. So as you might know that parents of children with recurrent cough or uh, wheezes might be concerned if they if their children might outgrow asthma. So in this case, if you have a child with recurrent um, uh, admission of cough and wheezes and they don't have asthma yet, do you use any diagnostic test or productive tools yeah. just to estimate or predict uh, if that, that child will develop asthma or not? So there is something called asthma predictive index, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that is basically a bunch of a bunch of factors that we look at, uh, including family history, um, existence of other atopic diseases in the same patient. If the family in the maternal side has asthma or allergies, that is higher predictor than the paternal side. Um, there are many of these factors that we put together, and we come up with what we call the asthma predictive index. Uh, it has shown pretty good. A predictive capability of predicting uh, who's going to be asthmatic and who's not going to be asthmatic. But it's still, it's a prediction and it's still as a guess. It's an intelligent guess. Now, as far as diagnostic tools, in the infants, there is something called infant pulmonary function testing. That is still a research tool. It is not a clinical tool yet. It's very difficult to, to do that. Uh, the expertise is very, we, we do have it here at SIDRA. Uh, but, but it's only used for research purposes at this point. Now, in the preschooler, again, there isn't much to do as far as physiological testing, except what we call IOS, uh, which is uh, impulse oscillometry, another research tool uh, that basically tries to measure some physiological measures. Now, after six years of age, then mm -hmm. a child who is, uh, has a good level of intelligence can actually perform spirometry and for and can can be tested for static lung volumes volumes as well. And there there are very specific patterns that indicates obstructive lung disease. We can do reversibility testing, and there are many physiological measures that we can use to assess us predicting whether this is asthma or not. Now, in general, what we do if uh, asthma predictive index is high, what I do in clinic is that I can promise a mother that the child is going to outgrow it, but there is a good chance. If they don't have high asthma predictive index, there is more than 70% chance that they are going to outgrow it before they go to school, School, as I showed in the, in the trajectory. Yeah. While if they have a high asthma predictive index, meaning that they have other allergies, they are very atopic, they have eczema, uh, you know, their, their mother has asthma or their parents or other, the other siblings have allergic rhinitis, asthma and so on, that is high level of uh, asthma predictive index and therefore you could you you could not really tell the family that there is a seventy percent chance that they are going to outgrow it, but actually there is it's a fifty fifty then. Fifty fifty. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. We have here also an interesting question. Uh, I think many would like to know the answer too. So, does the hygiene theory theory uh, mean that excessive cleaning environment contribute to asthma as the immune system is not exposed to germ that build immunity and uh, and tolerance? As a matter of fact, that's one of the strong uh, theories, which uh, you know, hygiene hypothesis is one of the very strong uh, schools of thought in in terms of uh, you know, in terms of development of asthma and allergic diseases. Um, uh, I personally have uh, I, I sit on the fence on that. Uh, I do believe that if somebody, if a family is just too clean, quote unquote, mm -hmm. too clean, I mean, they are just washing everything off. They, they tend to do that. They tend to wash these normal good bacteria, good, good bugs, and therefore uh, the immune system reacts to it by increasing, by shifting towards Th2. And therefore, the, 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 uh, the, uh, all the different type 2 sort of, sort of diseases become more prevalent, more uh, there's a chance that they're going to develop. So, so that, that's my belief. But on the other hand, and that is sort of supported with the epidemiological studies uh, showing that the underdeveloped or less developed countries have less prevalence of asthma as compared to more developed countries and quote unquote mm -hmm. cleaner uh, environments. Yes. All right, mm -hmm. shall we move on? Yes, yes, please. Thank right. you. Right. Let's now dig into the what confuses the clinicians and what is asthma and what is not asthma. All right, we'll start with the first case, and this is pretty straightforward. And I'd like to get some uh, feedback on this because this is the simplest case, the most classic case. It's a 10 year old boy is brought to the clinic because of recurrent, so that's the first thing, recurrent wheezing episodes that responds to bronchodilator, 
This episode comes suddenly, especially after bouts of upper respiratory tract infection, and are rather frequent once every three to four weeks and for the last six months. So here you can see that there is a, a classic description of what we put together and think of asthma. First thing, it's recurrent, so it's not one time off. And it's wheezing, so it's not crackles, it's wheezing. It's, it's episodic. It responds to bronchodilator, and they come rather suddenly, and it's triggered by upper respiratory tract infection. It's frequent, and it also has been going on for six months, long period of time, more than six weeks. So this is a classic case of asthma that has not been diagnosed and that has not been treated. So, so what are the what are the treatment that this child this child had in the in the part before coming to you? He has been treated with solbutamol, which is a short acting bronchodilator, a short acting beta two agonist, syrup, oral, and nebulizer. In addition to several courses of antibiotics of different classes, multiple types of antihistamines and mucolytics. And a trial of Montilucas was given two months ago, resulted in some delay in the next attack by about two months. So that tells you again, this child was given short acting bronchodilator. First of all, short acting bronchodilator syrups in my book should be taken off shelf. Nobody should be given oral uh, uh, beta 2 agonists. That is, to me, that, that, is, that is absolutely absurd. And unfortunately, there are a lot of, of practitioners out there, especially in private practice, they still do that. And, and I highly encourage them not to do that. Uh, as far as nebulization, yep, they, they, you know, and he and, and, and this kiddo has been responding to this, as we mentioned in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the first paragraph, he has been responding to short acting bronchodilator. So it means that the wheezing is likely, is likely related to bronchospasm. So we, when you when you dilate them with these sort of broken dilators, they actually the wheezing improved. But when another common unhealthy practice is giving antibiotics, as soon as the patient comes in with cough or, or, or cold or wheezing, they start giving antibiotics. There is no indication for antibiotics for asthma treatment. The only indication to give antibiotics in an, in an asthmatic child is when there is a bacterial infection associated with it, either an otitis media, a pneumonia, a skin infection, some sort of other than asthma. So there has to be an indication for antibiotics. And uh, so I think the, the next the CPD is about antibiotic stewardship, and this is one of those. So you got to be very careful. You don't want to go out there give antibiotics because they would tend to <coughs> induce resistance in the community. So therefore, no indication for antibiotics in asthmatics unless there is a direct, clear indication uh, of bacterial infection like otitis media, follicular tonsillitis, skin infection, pneumonia that is clear on a chest X-ray, and so on. Otherwise, there is no indication for antibiotics here. Then antihistamines. Antihistamines are not indicated for asthma per se, meaning if there is no associated allergic rhinitis or eczema or any other atopic diseases that is associated with asthma, then anti and antihistamines have no place there. While if they do have, and they commonly do have, and as a matter of fact, in the study of the 20, 2006, we showed that 34% of asthmatics, they actually had uh, allergic rhinitis with it as well. And therefore, in that, in that case, there might be an indication for an antihistamine and maybe topical nasal steroids if need be. Now, mucolytics. Mucolytics absolutely has no place in asthma, in asthma treatment. Mucolytics do nothing, except when you give it to an infant, they make them more gaggy. It actually worsens their situation. So, mucolytics should have no place in asthma management. Now, this kiddo was given a trial of Montilocast, and all of you know Montilocast is leukotriene receptor inhibitor, uh, and it is an adjuvant or a, a treatment that we give for mild asthmatics or as an add-on to moderate to persistent asthma, to severe asthmatics. So, Montilocast was given to this child, and he showed some improvement, and therefore this confirms our diagnosis or our suspicion of diagnosis that this child has actually asthma that has not been properly treated. Anybody has any disagreement with this or agreement with this? And I'm stopping here to, for any questions or comments. This is the first case. 
So please, uh, if you have any comment, uh, if you can type it in the in the chat. And it's uh, it's good that uh, Doctor you have pointed about the antibiotic and antihistamine use because I think this is usually let's say a mix we can see in the practice. Mm -hmm. uh, antibiotic, antihistamine, and mucolytic. Uh, this is very common, unfortunately. I'm sure our our colleagues from pharmacy college would love what they just heard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, do you have any comments um, about this case? Any question? Okay. Uh, we don't have uh, questions from the audience currently on this case. All right, let's move on then. Uh, we yeah. have a, a good number of cases. Let's move on. All right, so the next one is a 13 year old boy. Sorry, there was one question, sorry. Uh, the, the, the question is about the long term use of Monte Lucas and asthma and yeah. having, uh, mood changing behaviors in children. Yeah. So what's yeah. the evidence for this and would you recommend an alternative? Right. So so there is a small, a very small percent of kids who are on uh, uh, singular on, on Montilocast and they start having some behavioral uh, problems. And in that case, I just stop it. And the alternative, obviously, is inhaled corticosteroids. Uh, low dose, low dose inhaled corticosteroids. We'll be ta tackling this uh, at the end of this presentation, inshallah. Okay. So the next case is a 13 year old boy brought to the pediatric emergency center at 4 a.m. because of severe respiratory distress. He had upper respiratory tract infections since the day before presentation, was coughing before going to bed. And he woke up at about 2 a.m. with severe cough and increased work of breathing with severe wheezing. He had similar episodes three times in the past year and was treated in the pediatric emergency department with bronchodilators with good response and resolution of distress. He has been having difficulty in keeping up with his peers at football games. So again, uh, this is a, a very classic case again of asthma. Uh, what, what is the lesson behind this case? First of all, that the age is 13. So this is a teenager. Now we are not talking about transient visas. We're not talking about the preschoolers. This is a teenager, a 13 year old. So when they have asthma at this age, they most likely is real asthma. It's not transient asthma. And most likely they will keep it with them, unfortunately, for a number of years ahead of them. The other thing is that he is coming to the pediatric emergency department at the very time where most of the asthma attacks happen because of a decrease in the level of steroids, cortisone in your in the in, in the body uh, at 4 a.m. The trigger is very classic as well, upper respiratory tract infection. And he was having some triggers, some indication that he might end up with an exacerbation and this is a classic asthma exacerbation by, by showing cough before going to bed and he woke up at 2 a.m where the attack was was, was there he was he, he he was severely coughing had increased work of breathing and severe wheezing that is a classic asthma exacerbation or asthma attack he uh, the, the 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 proof that this is something that he uh, you know has been having uh, so this is asthma that he had similar episode three times in the past year. And he was treated in the emergency department with bronchodilator, had good response and resolution of distress. So he is very amicable for treatment of acute asthma. What's missing in here, as you can see, that he has not been put any on any controller. He has been having this on chronic basis and it started to affect, affect his quality of life by not being able to keep up with his peers at the games. And that in the case decrease uh, lung capacity, it decrease ability to keep up with. So, uh, so that's lung health is going down. So what's missing in this in this case is that this case, although it was basically reading the textbook of asthma, he has not been properly treated by not starting him on any controller medicine. In this case, this kid is a prime candidate for inhaled corticosteroids. That's for sure. So that is the message of this case any question comment on this one um yes doctor so maybe this is a simple question but um, um could be confusing for some yeah so do we have a difference when we say asthma or respiratory distress or reactive airway disease yes. do we have a difference or they are the same so, uh, asthma is the is the is the syndrome itself is the, is the disease itself that's asthma signs symptoms uh, trajectory the whole conglomeration of all that, that's asthma. Uh, now, 
uh, then uh, increase uh, what's respiratory distress. Respiratory distress is basically description of a symptom of a sign. This child mm -hmm. is in distress. He is working hard to breathe, so he is in distress. It could be respiratory mm -hmm. distress, but it could be some other distress. He's in pain. He is not happy. That's distress. He led to lead to distress. Respiratory distress is a description of a sign. Now, mm -hmm. reactive airway disease is used as a term when we are not really sure if this is asthma or not. We know that the airway is abnormal. It's overly reactive to triggers. Now, we all have to, you know, any 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 of us, if we were exposed to sort of certain triggers, we will wheeze, but we will wheeze and cough. But yes. at a certain level, that is normal in the in the in the in the majority of the population, and that's called the PC20 in the trigger test that we do, uh, provocation concentration 20, meaning that at the at the level of that concentration of whatever we are using, whether it is metacolin or or, or whatever we are using, let's say metacolin as a trigger of of, of airway of bronchospasm, at the level certain concentration 20 percent of people of normal people will be mm -hmm. that is not asthma so asthmatics when we want to kind of trigger and and see whether they are really wheezing and they have asthma they will start having symptoms way below pc20 the concentration that they will wheeze on is a lot less than the concentration that a normal person will be wheezing at so that is that airway is hyperreactive, is overly responsive. That is jerky airway, and that is reactive mm -hmm. airway. And we kind of we kind of use that when we are unsure whether this is asthma or not. So we say this is RAD, this is reactive airway dysfunction, mm -hmm. this is reactive airway disease. The bottom line is that when you aren't sure, when you, when you are sure that this looks like asthma, it's it it, it, it is is cocking like a duck and it's it's walking like a duck. It's a duck. You call it a duck when it's a, when it's asthma. It is asthma, regardless of the age. But if it's no, you're not sure, you want to do further studies, further analysis, further assessment to bring in more evidence towards diagnosis of asthma. And the transition, mm -hmm. sometimes we use this reactive airway disease, reactive airway dysregulation, dysfunction, whatever it is. Yeah, Does that perfect. answer Thank your you. question? Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, we have another question speaking of here football games. Uh, so we know that the exercise could be an exacerbating factor for asthma. Yeah. On the other side, uh, do you recommend any certain kind of exercise for asthmatic kids? Do the exercise improve the lung function of these kids or not? Very good question. So there is a category or a, an entity of asthma called exercise induced asthma. That is not the most common, but it is common in teenagers mm -hmm. say it again i say it again exercise okay. induced asthma is not the most common type of asthma in general but in the age group of teenagers there is more prevalence of exercise induced asthma as compared to other age groups and therefore in school age you find this exercise induced asthma not in not infrequently they okay. have Asthma symptoms, asthma attacks, tightness of the chest, wheezing or no, cough, dry cough during the game. Mm -hmm. And there is treatment for that. What we do is before the game, about 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes before the game, we give them short acting bronchodilators. And on mm -hmm. chronic basis, Montilocast and the leukotriene receptor antagonists have shown efficacy in exercise induced asthma. So that is exercise induced asthma. Mm -hmm. Now, exercise in asthmatics. Mm -hmm. Exercise in asthmatics in general. Is it good or is it not good? If they are well controlled, if their asthma is well controlled, exercise is good for them. Mm -hmm. Why exercise is good for them? It increases, improves the lung pulmonary endurance. Endurance of the lung improves by exercising. This is this is very natural. In normal kids and in also asthmatic kids. So if they we and the one of the aims of asthma treatment, asthma management that we might mention at the end is to basically give them enough controller and avoidance of allergens to be able to live their life normally and exercise normally and participate in games, participate in mm -hmm. competitive sports, whatever they like. So we need to get them to that level of control so they wouldn't be hampered 
by their disease, by their asthma, from no, living a normal life in a kid who, if a kid has, let's say, has a hobby of swimming or hobby of volleyball or whatever, they need to go ahead and do it. And we need, mm -hmm. as a physician and, 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 and provider of care, we need to make sure that they are well uh, supported from the controller standpoint. There is also one thing what we, we, we mentioned, we ought to mention in here is pulmonary rehabilitation programs. Pulmonary mm -hmm. rehabilitation programs in asthmatics and all the other chronic lung diseases are very important. And the, gay, the, 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 the uh, goal of the pulmonary rehabilitation program is to improve lung health and pulmonary endurance to a level that would require a lot less oxygen consumption. Mm -hmm. During your exercise, mm -hmm. during your your activity, what we call VO max, the yeah, amount yeah. of oxygen that is the maximum amount of oxygen that is uh, used in a in a in a minute. Mm -hmm. So that measure, we monitor and with the pulmonary rehabilitation program by exercising them stepwise slowly upward, we aim to decrease the VO maxes as much as we can, so we can have really improved lung health. Perfect. And um, I think pulmonary rehab program is available in Qatar. Uh, in adults, in, in, in pediatric, it's not, unfortunately, it's not available yet. But in adults, it oh. is available. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, we don't have further questions for now. Moving on to the next one then. So the next case, as we move on now, this is your RAD. Yeah, right there, there, right there. Reactive airway disease is coming on board here now. So it's a three-year-old girl. Who has been treated for RAD, reactive airway disease, with nebulized polycort, which is budesonide, inhaled steroid, for the last six months, has been uncontrolled, unfortunately, for the last two months, with frequent wheezing episodes and constant upper respiratory tract illness. She has been tried on singular again, which is Montilocas, as I mentioned, and theophylline suppositories without much improvement. On physical examination, she is not in distress and her lungs are clear, apart from occasional expiratory wheezing. Her ear, nose, and throat examination is showing clear nasal discharge and a plus three over four tonsillar hypertrophy. So, this case is a very interesting case, a very classic case that we do see in the clinic rather frequently. It's a toddler, it's a three year old, so this is a preschooler, smaller. Uh, has been uh, rather labeled and treated as RAD because somebody is very uncomfortable saying that this is asthma because this is only three year old, so they were not sure whether to call it asthma or not. But anyways, they have been treating as asthma, so they just labeled it as RAD and treated as asthma with polymicord. Six months she has been on this, but unfortunately not being controlled over two months. Uh, and the uh, and uncontrolledness is happening is, is showing as wheezing episodes. The other thing is that she has constant nasal symptoms. And this is the key. There is constant, and it's not just upper respiratory tract infection, episodic three to five days and goes away. This is constant. The nose is running throughout for the last two months. She has been tried on this asthma therapy, singular. But the other thing is that somebody has put some suppositories. Theophylline, as you know, uh, in, in, you know there are there are the, theophylline used to be an old an old asthma therapy. It ha, it is a good therapy, but it has a very narrow therapeutic uh, uh, range and uh, um, a window. Sorry, and, and therefore the side effect can happen very quickly. The other thing is that these suppositories. I don't know. Somebody has has really uh, invented these suppositories that I hate. Uh, and unfortunately, in, in, in some of the private practices, they are using this. And in my book, I never used the often never. For the last 29 years that I've been practicing with, with asthma in kids, never used the often suppositories. Uh, the other thing is that uh, despite the fact that this kid was, being, was put on singular and the uh, there was not much improvement. And the key here, now we'll go to the key. On physical examination, uh, she's not in distress. Lungs are clear. It's a little bit of occasional expiratory wheezing, fine. Uh, that could be still uncontrolled asthma. But the key is her ENT. As you can see that her ENT is showing clear nasal discharge. And there's tonsillar hypertrophy. That could and most likely indicates allergic rhinitis. Clear nasal discharge and typically is associated also with 
edematous nasal mucosa, and it's typically pale with a blue halo, unlike the acute rhinitis that you see with bacterial rhinitis or even viral rhinitis when you see when you see erythema of the mucosa. Here you see pallor, unlike acute infection and when there is allergic infection allergic sorry uh, allergic signs there is pallor in the nasal mucosa and there is clear discharge non mucoid clear discharge so this is this ch this child most likely has allergic rhinitis associated with her asthma and i'm very comfortable saying that this is asthma this is childhood asthma and most likely this is a mild persistent asthma with allergic rhinitis that has not been properly or adequately treated the concept behind this case is what we call the concept of united airways. The airways are linked, nose and airways and trachea and the other parts of the airway is linked. It's not dissociated. So if you have allergic rhinitis and asthma, your asthma control cannot be adequately done without controlling the nasal symptoms and nasal, nasal allergies and the other way around as well. If you have asthma and you have nasal allergies, you're just focused on the nasal allergies, you're ignoring the asthma, asthma might kill you. So therefore, you need to treat the whole airway allergies as well. Now, the first thing you would do is see if there is any triggers, any antigens that would trigger, any allergens. And if there are allergens, allergen avoidance. First thing, allergen avoidance. On top of that, you start treating both allergic radiators and asthma at the same time. No place for things like antibiotics here, except if that tonsil that is large is actually infected with bacteria, what we call follicular tonsillitis. You see pus follicles. Then you need to give antibiotics. Now the tonsils are big, it's three over four. The next question that you ought to ask whether there is obstructive sleep apnea, because a kid like this might be snoring and might be obstructing during sleep. Uh, so one thing that you need, to, you ought to proactively ask the parents, how is the sleep? Is he, is he, is, is she comfortable sleeping? Does she wheeze? Uh, sorry, does she snore when she's sleeping or not? And if she does, does she stop breathing and has these episodes of obstruction that are obvious or not? This is a kid that I would probably refer to a specialist, pulmonology or allergy immunology, mainly, mainly pulmonology, since there is this this potential for OSA of obstructive sleep apnea, then pulmonology is the right clinic to refer these kids to. In pulmonology, we do full assessment and we might resort to doing sleep study to make sure that there is no obstructive apnea on top of it. If there is, you need to treat all of them. If the, if the obstruction is significant enough after a period of proper treatment of allergic rhinitis and asthma, you repeat the sleep study. If there isn't much improvement, then tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy might be indicated. So this is the essence of this case. Now, questions, comment on this case? Yes, um, I think we, I have a question uh, regarding... Uh, okay, let me just see the question. Okay, so first let me ask, um, there's a question about inhaled corticosteroid. Yeah. So, do you think all child, all children with asthma should be in an in, inhaled corticosteroid, and for how long can we reduce or discontinue the treatment? Yeah. Well, lifelong they, or not? Yeah. So they are jumping the wagon. And I, I left this actually to the end of the presentation where I doing the management. But anyway, to answer this question, yeah, the inhaled corticosteroid is the mainstay of treatment for asthma in general. Uh, there are levels, obviously, and, and each level of asthma severity, which we'll be tackling after finishing their cases. Uh, there is indication for certain uh, certain uh, doses of inhaled corticosteroids. And typically, we do the strategy of a step up, step down. So there is no such a thing as that they need it for three months or four months, and that's it. Or they need it for lifelong. There is no such a thing. Asthma mm -hmm. is chronic disease. It waxes and wanes. Control goes up and down. And the hallmark of treatment of asthma is chronic, uh, persistent follow-up, recurrent follow-up with the specialist with close monitoring of their progress. And asthma that starts with severe persistent might change into mild intermittent uh, in, in, no, in no time if you, you, you properly treat. And then that, in that case, you don't need to keep them on the high level of asthma controller when they are extremely well controlled. Then you can do a step down. 
you can you can on the other hand do a step up you start with a small dose of inhaled the corticosteroid bring them back in two to three months repeat their testing check check them out uh do the assessment if they are not well controlled you step up instead of 50 micrograms uh, per puff, you might do 125 microgram, micrograms per puff of fluticasol, and so on. There is a, this is this is a strategy that I will be uh, dis discussing in details, inshallah, uh, at the end of the presentation if we have time. Perfect. So I have a question related to this case. So the audience is asking. So this uh, girl uh, has tonsillar hypertrophy, which yeah. usually results from viral infections. Will the surgical treatment for hypertrophy resolve the symptoms? And if not surgical. What treatment will provide? We provide to treat the tonsillar hypertrophy in her case. Well, first of all, we need to differentiate between acute hypertrophy and chronic hypertrophy. Now, the acute illness, acute infection of the tonsils and pharynx can lead to a little bit of enlarged tonsils, just as just transient. That is because of acute inflammation. There is no indication for surgery with with acute tonsillitis or acute tonsillar hypertrophy. No. Mm -hmm. But if chronic hypertrophy that leads to obstructive sleep apnea, then there might be indication for tonsillectomy adenoidectomy, especially if this is after proper treatment of asthma and after proper treatment of allergic rhinitis, meaning the inhaled steroids, nasal steroids, montilocast for a good four to six months did not end up did not result in any relief of the obstruction, then yep, there might be an indication for the, for the indication of obstructive apnea. The other indication of tonsillectomy, if there is a recurrent bacterial, postural bacterial tonsillitis that leads to high fever, persistent bacterial infection. So let's say four or five times a year, no, we're not talking about pharyngitis. We're talking about tonsillitis. We're talking about follicular tonsillitis. That if that happens frequently, meaning three to four to five, six times a year, then there might be indication to take them out to avoid endocarditis, to avoid uh, infective endocarditis. That's the main, mm -hmm. the main, uh, the main uh, indication. Perfect. And we have a last question here. I think it's related to case one. Uh, so, does salbutamol syrup have have a place in the advanced asthma management? Absolutely no. No. In okay. in one breath, no. Please. <laughs> okay. okay. So perfect. Uh, here, um, no. yeah, I have a question for this case. Uh, with this case, do you think given antihistamine will benefit uh, as uh, AR and asthma combined? Yes. Yes. This the antihistamine is indicated in this case for sure. Antihistamine. And nasal steroid are very much indicated in this case. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Let's move on. The next one. Pay attention to this one. This is a, one of the bigger asthma mimickers. This is a 14 year old girl complains of attacks of severe shortness of breath, suffocation that occurs suddenly, especially when she is playing volleyball at school. She uses Ventolin frequently when she gets these attacks without much help. She has been maintained on fluticasone, which is inhaled corticosteroid, MDIs, meter dose inhalers, for the last six months without much improvement in the frequency or severity of these attacks. In the clinic, she's completely asymptomatic and has an absolutely normal physical examination. And her pulmonary function testing is absolutely normal. So, this is a classic case. I'm just going to. Uh, uh, give you the answer to what the diagnosis is and give you the tips. The diagnosis of this case is vocal cord dysfunction, vocal cord dysfunction. This is not asthma, but it comes in as severe asthma. It looks like severe shortness of pressure, severe asthma. And typically this happens in teenagers, girls mainly more than boys, but it can happen in boys, high achievers, the ones that if they, if they go down in, in and in, in their uh, exam mark by one mark, they start crying for the for the rest of the night. Those those kids, those kids, uh, all the competitors in in like volleyball and in, uh, in, in swimming and whatever. They are they're very competitive. They are very conscious about their performance. They are really uptight. Simply speaking, they are uptight. Those kids, and when they have these episodes, this is more of a conversion reaction. This is more of a conversion reaction. This is not real asthma or real disease what happens is that they convert vocal cord movement and it's actually vocal cords move paradoxically 
what happens during during our breathing we during inspiration we open vocal cords and during expiration it adduct, adducts naturally it will open and it adducts abduction adduction here in, in in these cases when they start being conscious around oh they are not able to do whatever you know they, they start kind of getting tense their vocal cord goes the other way around they close during inspiration and open during expiration not open open actually they close during inspiration and they little bit of of, of movement adduct in, in abduction during expiration and majority of them they get stay in the middle and they start shaking like this what we do is we scope these kids we do a laryngoscopy during the attack we induce attack we do a laryngoscopy see the vocal cords and then confirm that this is actually vocal cord dysfunction because of this conversion reaction that is happening what is the treatment it's breathing exercise it's basically biofeedback it's trying to get their their mind off their breathing their mind off that i can't do it we try to put their mind away from the breathing piece. So what do we do? We ask them to put some books or some sort of a weight on their belly while they're on their supine and ask them to watch that book. During inspiration, that book should go up. And then when they expire, the book goes down. Up, down, what is that? So when we ask them to do that, we are asking them to open the vocal cords during inspiration so they can push the diaphragm when they push the diaphragm the book goes up and the diaphragm is pushed when they open up the vocal cords so we are retraining the vocal cords that's called breathing exercise and this is the typical treatment for these types of cases every few months we have a case like this that comes to our clinic the treatment is not to give more inhaled steroid actually you're hurting them it's many times we get cases like this that have been on steroids and high doses of inhaler and oral steroids and bursts, bursts of steroids for the last two to three years because they are suffocating at that point. When somebody really gets alert and they pound, bounce them with, you know, pound them with this with the steroids, so they come with side effects of steroids and other things. Therefore, these cases, when you are not sure if this is asthma or not, refer them to us. We will be able to, inshallah, diagnose them. Oh, no. Uh, so, doctor, we have a question here. Um, so, the audience is asking, since this happened when they get tensed or stressed, mm. so does this mean the symptoms are psychological or still something physical? No, it is psychological, but it, it trend, tends, tends into physical. This is like mm. psychosomatic, one of those psychosomatic diseases. Uh, this is like, I mean, really, in, in some kids, some patients, uh, they can have this conversion reaction to the extent that they actually get, they look like paralyzed. You know, some of some of these conversion reactions that end up patients unable to walk at all. Really, they you know, they cannot walk. They don't have any power. It, it actually turns into a physical sign while this is actually psychological. And the treatment is to kind of mentally treat them by distracting their attention to to their disease. Perfect. And doctor, oh, uh, it's interesting. Uh, we can see different asthma mimickers. Uh, so the question here. Do you think it's common that the practitioner might miss uh, diagnose asthma? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Is, is it common? Yeah, Absolutely, it's common. I mean, I mean, uh, unfortunately, a lot of what is labeled as asthma when we see them is not asthma actually. Unfortunately, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we move on? Yes. Do we do more cases, uh, now or shall we skip the cases and go to the? Because we are. Uh, we can do one more. It's already seven o'clock. If you want, we can do one, one more case and we can skip to the, uh, okay. if you are okay with this. I'm okay with any anything you like. Sure, one more case, because okay. the cases are interesting. Yeah, they are all, but this is pretty straightforward case. Uh, okay. and, and this is not uncommon. I don't think anybody would, would have a problem with diagnosing this patient, is uh, how to manage it. So this is a two-year-old girl, was previously healthy, brought to the pediatric emergency because of her sudden onset of respiratory distress. So sudden is the key here. A uh, child was watching cartoon on TV and was unattended while her mother as, uh, was in the kitchen. Child was, uh, has increased work of breathing and cough. And on chest examination, there is uh, the air exchange uh, on the right is more than the left. So there is unilateral wheezing. And the diagnosis is what, Amuna? Yeah. 
foreign uh, yeah, body yeah. yeah, it yeah. is foreign body aspiration, absolutely. So I'm sure everybody knows this is foreign body aspiration. How do we confirm diagnosis? This is now inspiratory, expiratory film. And the left side is inspiratory film. So the air goes in and fills, fills the, the lungs. And on the right side, uh, when he expires out, the left lung, sorry, the right lung is still hyperinflated. This is secondary to what? This is secondary to ball valve effects. There is a foreign body on the right side here, most likely. Mm -hmm. There is also a telactasis, as you can see, there is the, the which, which collapse in here as well. Uh, we've developed an algorithm for this, for the foreign bodies, uh, to make it easier for the emergency physician to decide what to do with them, when to send them for flexible bronchoscopy versus rigid bronchoscopy, and when to actually repeat chest X-ray, or when to send them home, and so on. I don't want to waste too much of your time in here because this is, this is more of a pulmonology and emergency department uh, uh, algorithm, but you can uh, look up that, uh, I put the reference uh, that you can look it up and uh, you can look up the uh, algorithm if you're interested. Uh, there are many more cases, so let's skip cases if you are okay. Uh, okay. uh, and this, if there's anything that, okay, then, yeah, I mean, this, this is another, another classic case uh, why, why don't I just give you the diagnosis? How about that? Okay. How about that? Instead of going through the cases. So this okay. one, uh, five months old girl, Sharif Ash, uh, mild distress, saturation, can super uh, she has treated, start being steroid. This is inadequately treated. This is inadequately treated uh, infant uh, who has wheezing and all that. Uh, so this kid needs further assessment. Uh, the other one is, uh, this is a five-year-old, uh, asthma, inhaled steroid, singular, three years, refer to your clinic secondary to, uh, so second opinion, because she has been having chronic, and this is the key, wet cough. So wet cough is not part of asthma. When you have wet cough, you have to think about other things. This wet cough has been responding to antibiotics. Now, this is indicated to treat whatever is causing this wet cough. So when there's wet cough, unlikely to be asthma. You ought to know what's going on. When you did a chest X-ray, you find this chest X-ray. What is the main, the main finding in this chest X-ray that you can see very clearly? Huh? There is dextrocardia. You can see the heart is on the other side. And there are multiple atelectasis, and there is this, these kind of ring signs, and that's bronchiectasis. So this kid does not have asthma. He might have an asthma component to his primary disease, which is primary ciliary dyskinesia. This is an inherited ciliary problem. They can have a, an, on top of a coexistence of reactive airway or asthma component, but their main problem is infection of the, of the, of the lung, of the, of, of the airways in the lung because of problem with the cilia. And again, this, uh, this is details around the cilia and the types and all that. I'm gonna skip this. Uh, here is now the classification of asthma cephalic. So there are, uh, Four levels of severity, severity in asthma. There is mild intermittent, then we have mild persistent, then we have moderate persistent, and then we have severe persistent. What, how to differentiate between them? That's the, the, in the GINA guideline, which is one of the most important guidelines that we follow in asthma management, it says that in the intermittent, mild intermittent, the symptoms are intermittent less than one times a week. I think you have a question about this sometime, somewhere. Huh? Okay, so pay attention. There's an exam question of it. Tarshish. <laughs> okay, so there is there is uh, they are asymptomatic in between. Their pulmonary function test is normal, and their symptoms is less than one time a week. Uh, they don't have uh, too much of nocturnal or nighttime symptoms. Their nighttime symptoms less than twice a week, uh, twice a month. Sorry, and their pulmonary their pulmonary function test is pretty much normal more than 80% predicted. And the variability between uh, 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 attacks is less than uh, 20%. So this is the mild intermittent, and this is step one. And in step one, we have some mild treatment that we could use. We could use either short acting bronchodilator and intermittent basis. We could use uh, Montilocast uh, alone, or we could use inhaled corticosteroid at very low dose, either persistent or with episodes. Uh, those are some of the options. I think we have, we have that covered in another slide. When you go on a little bit higher in the severity, we, call, we talk about mild persistent. And they, in this case, they have uh, more than one time a week of symptoms 
uh, per week, but, but they have less than one every day, less, less than once a, once a day. And their nighttime symptom is more than twice a month. They have a nighttime symptom and the predicted value is, uh, sorry, and their, and their asthma, sorry, their, their FEV1 and peak flows are uh, within uh, about 20, 80%, just about 80% or, or just a little bit below, and their variability uh, is 20 to 30%. While in step three, when we go to step three, uh, they have attacks uh, on daily basis. They have attacks on daily basis. Their nighttime symptoms is once a week or so, and their pulmonary function test is affected by uh, dropping to 20, 60 to 80% predicted only, and their variability is more than 30%. Uh, and that is moderate persistence. In the severe, uh, when we go to the severe one, they have basically limitation of their physical activity uh, because of the symptoms. They have nighttime, frequent nighttime uh, uh, symptoms, and their pulmonary function test is less than 60% predicted. How to diagnose them? The first thing is history and physical examination, as I mentioned earlier on. That's the key. And then we have the golden, the golden uh, uh, tool that we have to diagnose obstructive and restrictive lung disease. And that is pulmonary function testing. Now, pulmonary function testing is a very generic term that includes many of these different tests. We have spirometry. In a spirometry, we are measuring dynamic flows. Uh, and we can do reversibility, meaning bronchodilator response. Do they open up with the bronchodilator or not? So we repeat it. Uh, so that is dynamic flow. That is through spirometry. The second bunch of measures that we do, we do static lung volumes total lung capacity, functional residual capacity, residual volume, uh, residual volume over functional residual capacity, and uh, over total lung, lung capacity. And that is done through either body plethysmography or through the uh, gas dilution testing, nitrogen washout uh, technique, or there are some of the other techniques like SF6 techniques and so on. There are different techniques to basically measure the volume of the lung. So that is a static lung volume. The first one was dynamic flows. The second one is a static lung volume. The third one is provocation testing, and that provocation, we are trying to provo pro provoke the airways to go in spasm. And how do we do that? We either do it by exercise or we do it by giving them uh, 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 chemical provocators like, like metacolin or mannitol that basically leads to bronchospasm. And as I mentioned earlier, there is certain level of concentration of mannitol or concentration of, uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, metacolin that everybody will wheeze, and that is 20%. 20% of people, of normal people, will, will, will wheeze at this level, at this concentration of metacolin. If somebody wheezes a lot, with a lot less concentration, they have hyperreactive airway. That is an indication of asthma. The other thing which we do is basically we do pheno, function, fraction of exhaled nitric oxide. The nitric oxide is a gas that is produced by, you know, from, from the lung and from the other places as well. And nitric oxide, exhaled nitric oxide has been closely linked to eosinophilic inflammation of IgE mediated inflammation. So the type 2 asthmatics, they have a high level of exhaled nitric oxide levels, typically above 25 parts per million. <coughs> Now, on the left side here, this is a typical flow volume look that you can see. Anything below this, low, this, this line is inspiratory. Anything above this is expiratory. So anything that is extra thoracic, like vocal cord dysfunction, like, the, the, like tracheal problem, sorry, like, like laryngeal problem, will be shown by abnormalities in the, low, in the loop before, below the, this line. Anything that is in behind or below, sorry, below the thoracic inlet, you will see the effect on the expiratory loop in here. That, 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 so the blue here is the normal, the normal flow loop, inspiratory, expiratory. So inspiratory like this, and they go expire. This is the uh, peak flow at this point, And then they exhale, exhale until emptying, until residual volume. This line, is the expiratory line, and it's very important to be straightforward, like this. This is from here to here is FEF2575. At this point is FEV1, okay? This one is, is FE100, FEV100, خلاص, خلاص. And then the other thing which you critically look at is the, the loop, the, the, the scooping. If you find the scooping like this, this is obstruction. If you find that the peak flow is low, that's obstruction. See, that's the normal peak flow. This is the low peak flow. That's obstruction. Now, in restriction, on the other hand, the peak flow is high, but they don't, and they empty very quickly. They empty their lung very quickly. 
because there is a lot of recoil. Recoil pressure is very high, but they are not scooped. They are not scooped. As a matter of fact, sometimes they are concave. And that is the restrictive lung disease. So this is obstructive lung disease. This is restrictive lung disease. Clear? Treatment-wise, management, as we were mentioning in the in the step one, where the mild intermittent, you could either do a low dose uh, inhaled corticosteroids, or you could do uh, 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 as needed uh, short-acting bronchodilator. Uh, and then if you move on to the next level, you either do a low dose inhaled corticosteroids on a daily basis, or you do uh, uh, as needed uh, with bursts of, of inhaled corticosteroids. When you go to step three, which is moderate persistent, now we're talking about uh, a much higher dose of uh, uh, either either a higher medium to high dose of inhaled corticosteroid or the combination of low dose inhaled corticosteroid and long acting bronchodilator V2 agonist. Uh, as you move on, you increase that the, the level. There is certain uh, um, the certain dose of inhaled corticosteroid beyond which you don't get much improvement. And typically, anything close to 1,000 microgram of fluticasone that is the maximum that you can give, and that is 500 micrograms BID. So that is that is the maximum you could give uh, without, and you would incur side effects once you go above above those for sure. Uh, I typically do not exceed the 250 BID, which is the 500 microgram of luticasone per day, even in the severe asthmatics. I, I do add on like LABA and uh, leukotriene uh, receptor inhibitor antagonist. I do that on top of, uh, of my uh, combination therapy. And once we go to step five, which is basically steroid dependent, uh, uh, asthmatic, then you, you are talking about biologics. You're talking about either anti-IgE, uh, like Zolaire, uh, or you are going to do anti-IL-5, IL, uh, anti-IL-5 uh, omelizumab, or you can do anti-IL-4, IL-4, IL-5, IL-13 receptor, uh, which is dupilumab. And those are those are all biologics, and uh, we don't resort to those biologics until, first of all, they have to be type 2 asthmatic, they have to be allergic to asthmatic very clearly, and they have to be uncontrollable with the conventional therapy like, you know, a classic and health steroid and uh, multilocast. So that is the uh, 6 to 11, and the same thing goes for the, uh, the above 12 and the adults, very similar. In addition to, uh, in the, in, when we go to the, to the severe ones, the moderate to severe ones, we can add uh, the thiotropium. Uh, 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 in addition to the inhaled corticosteroids and long-acting bronchodilator therapy. These therapies, obviously, when you go to those levels, you ought to be subspecialists. You don't do this in, in, the, in the outpatient clinic of a, of a, of a GP clinic. This, these, are, uh, these, these kids who have moderate to, to severe asthma, they do not belong to general hospitals. They do belong to subspecialty clinics. Uh, and as I said earlier on, that there is the strategy is a step up, a step down. So we always go in the cycle of uh, uh, doing the assessment, adjusting the treatment, reviewing the response, and moving on in this cycle as you move on. And typically, you want to see these asthmatics, depending on their severity and control level, anywhere between two months to six months frequency, depending on their the level of the severity and the control that they uh, they have. So. Uh, this is my last slide, and they basically a take-home message that asthma is the most common chronic uh, disease in, in children, non-communicable non disease in children, and its prevalence has unfortunately been increased. Uh, it has been increasing uh, globally, uh, and Qatar is no, no uh, exception. Uh, the most important message out of this uh, lecture today that not all that, was, that wheezes is asthma, and proper diagnosis uh, uh, is of paramount importance before really embarking on any treatment. The first thing is to make sure that you are treating asthma before you start re treating asthma. The determination of the severity is important and helps in proper management selection, and severity actually changes as disease changes its status. Therefore, management needs to be modified uh, accordingly, either step up or step down, and really have a very low threshold or to refer to a specialist when you are in doubt. When you are in any doubt, do not waste time. Send them to the specialist. Make sure that you do because these are precious years of this kid's life, and you don't want to just uh, sit on them when, when you are not sure whether this is asthma or not, uh, or we are properly treating or not. Send them to the help specialist, especially in Qatar. We have access, you have access to uh, all the different pulmonary and allergy clinics. We have clinics 
you know, we, we, we run 23 clinics a week in, in Sidra, and there is uh, about another uh, probably eight to 10 clinics in Hamad, between, between Hamad General, uh, Wakra, and the Fort. So uh, with this, uh, I'd like to thank you all and thank uh, Dr. Muna, Dr. Zakaria, and the Qatar University uh, for their uh, generous invitation. And I hope that uh, I was of any of some value for uh, our, our audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Janahi, for this informative, comprehensive, and I think interactive session. Thank you so much. Uh, doctor, we have a few questions, if you don't mind to answer uh, this. Uh, regarding the, um, okay, uh, I think we have a lot of questions about corticosteroids. Mm. So, uh, the question is that why now they are recommending the use of low dose inhaled corticosteroid formitilor as PRN instead of salbutamol uh, in adults and it can be used in children as PRN? Correct. Uh, so, one of the newer strategies of, of treating uh, asthma uh, has been basically using the combination therapy uh, on as needed basis instead of using short acting. Uh, beta 2 agonist as well as needed. Now, uh, there is a strong recommendation around using uh, four meter uh, budesonide uh, uh, on uh, one as needed basis. Uh, one of the reasons that uh, four meter has a very a very quick uh, action. They they start starts starts working in three minutes. Uh, very similar to uh, what uh, solbutamol does. So therefore, and, and, and having on top of it, uh, budesonide is a health steroid uh, has a lot of uh, advantage and therefore some of the newer uh, strategies is, is, is like that. And personally, a good percent of my patients are treated that way. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, and the outcome, I think, is, uh, you know, the, the key, the key uh, to, to, to this is basically cater making whatever plan works with the patient and the family many times. You put whatever you want to do, the family will not follow what you wish to do. So you need to work with the family, work with the child, what would work with them. Anything is better than nothing, obviously. And if the child allows you and the family allows you to do the optimum, you work towards optimum. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And speaking again of the use of inhaled corticosteroid uh, as a, a, let's say, controller, so in this population, we have a recommendation of either using low dose corticosteroid whenever we use SABA or daily low dose inhaled corticosteroid. So which approach do you recommend? Is it based on cost wise, based no. on the family? It is based on the family. To, to me, again, I would work with my, my families. I would work with them. Whatever, whatever they are they are comfortable with, they will do, I will, I will work with them. I have now, now we have the, the, this flexibility. In the past, we didn't have this flexibility. It's all, always like, you ought to take daily health steroid, otherwise you're going to hell. And that's, that's you know, that, that strategy has been modified now. So there is option. Uh, they are giving the family, they are giving me as a practitioner an option to do this or that. So I would work with the families. And obviously the first thing is, Make sure that the child will be okay with either of these. And there are some certain certain children with asthma, their asthma severity is so bad that intermittent therapy will not work with them. They need to be on daily, some sort of a daily pro prophylaxis. So those are different kinds, but that's the minority. Majority of the children with asthma, they can be controlled with either pro strategies. Okay, perfect. And again, speaking of the inhaled corticosteroid, so does uh doesn't health corticosteroid uh, have role in patients with fixed air, um, airflow limitation who have like no. uh, incomplete reversible? No. No, and, and again, those, it, it, yeah. again, it, this is not a clean cut. It's not a clean cut. Mm -hmm. Finding fixed reversible, irreversible obstructive lung disease in one pulmonary function testing does not mean that this patient has an irreversible airway disease. That is just without finding. Now, if there are asthma mimickers who would have fixed airway disease and it's it's pointless to keep bronchodilating them or giving them in health steroid when it is mechanical. And that can be a, a case like vascular ring, for example. The vascular ring will, will compress the, the trachea and it would mm -hmm. the will very, very will be very clear. There is there is fixed obstruction and there is no reversibility. In that case, you don't give bronchodilators in health steroid. The other one, bronchiactasis. You have bronchiactasis. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, if you have a lot of bronchiactasis or bronchomalacia, you have a bad bronchomalacia. In that case, if you get bronchodilator, it actually have the reverse effect. 
it worsens obstruction because in bronchomalacia they are dependent on that muscle tone smooth muscle tone in the airway to to stint the airway to stint the airway and therefore if you dilate it if you relax that muscle that stinting goes away and the airway becomes more floppier and it obstructs mm -hmm. even further that is in bronchomalacia in the pulmonary function testing you will see obstruction obstruction how would you differentiate you will give a bronchodilator the first one which is asthmatic they improve their FAB1 improves, their FBC improves, their PF, FEF2575 improves, their peak flow improves. The other one, they get worse. As a matter of fact, they might drop their, their flow. In that case, there is no indication for inhaled steroid and there's no indication for bronchodilators. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question uh, related to uh, genetics uh, and asthma. Mm. So some one of the audience wants to know if uh, an adult on, uh, onset asthma, will it be considered as genetic and pass it onto the children? Uh, if someone asthma and yeah. 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 So yeah. asthma is not a monogenic disease, as I mentioned. Asthma is mm -hmm. a polygenic and polyfactorial. It's multifactorial. Mm -hmm. It is not just, uh, there is no such a thing as single asthma gene. There is gene candidates. There are more mm -hmm. than 20, now almost 30 something candidate genes for asthma. One of them is called ORMDL3, for example. ORMDL3 is a very well-known asthma gene. By itself means nothing. Means that you mm -hmm. carry a, a gene that, you know, codes for asthma, for, for airway hyper-responsiveness. But with all the other factors coming on board and having environmental factor on top of it, then asthma triggers, asthma symptoms show up. Now, yeah. will will you pass on asthma to your 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 kids? You, probably you will you will pass on the genes, but that doesn't mean that they will have asthma. They might have asthma or might not have asthma, depending on the other factors. Now, remember that there's the 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 environment gene interaction happens through methylation and hydroxylation, what we call epigenetics. So the epigenetic mechanisms that that basically translate an environmental challenge into a genetic modification, that mm -hmm. takes years. There are, and it's very complex, and there are many other factors. And the other thing is that there are pathways that go around and try to bypass some of the straightforward uh, uh, pathways of asthma genetics. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Speaking around the same topic, uh, let's say um, other than the genes and uh, environmental factors, is there a relation between the mother uh, lifestyle in terms of diet or antibiotic use or obesity in terms of having or um, like increasing the risk of her uh, neonates to have uh, yes. asthma. Before we talk about the mother, let's talk about lifestyle and asthma in as in children to start with. So there are types of asthma, as we know. As I said, there is this atopic type of asthma, the type two asthma. That's very classic. Then we have mm -hmm. the non-atopic, the another asthma which we call endotype, which is a Th1 sort of asthma. They are not atopic. They're Cytokine profile is a TH1 type of profile, IL1, uh, TNF alpha, uh, IL10. Uh, they they have elevated neutrophilic sort of sort of measures. Obesity, obese asthmatic, they are more towards TH1 than TH2. Mm -hmm. TH1 group is really less responsive to classic asthma therapy, less responsive to inhaled steroid. Group two, type two, they are more responsive to inhaled steroid. Lifestyle, how lifestyle interacts with this? As I said, there is there's so much interaction between the environment and the genes. Environment is not just air pollution or dust or perfumes. That is not just not just that. Lifestyle, mm -hmm. food, diet, exercise, sleep, stress, they all upregulate or downregulate down a bunch of genes that would impact the other group of genes. They interact with each other. As an example, obese kids, obesity increases leptin. Mm -hmm. Leptin yes, yes. Can, can lead to airway hyperresponsiveness. Having a lot of fat in your diet switches what we call the sphingolipid pathway from there is a lot less de novo sphingolipids as compared to acquired sphingolipids through the diet. That mm -hmm. flips the, the balance of sphingolipids, leading to less de novo sphingolipids. 
that status can lead to airway hyperresponsiveness. That is not inflammatory mediated. Mm -hmm. There is interaction between this mechanism and ORM, ORMDL DL3, which is an asthma gene. It affects that pathway as well. It's very complex. What I'm trying to say is very complex. Yeah. It is not simple as that, oh, you know, I have asthma or I have obesity, I'm going to pass it on. Now, this is mm -hmm. the kids, mother, mother's lifestyle, very important impact on their fetus. They, she, the fetus is in her. Her blood goes there. Whatever is in her blood goes there too. Obesity, smoking, very bad, very, very, very bad. Everything that you can think about can happen because mother smoking. Shisha is a bad smoking habit, by the way. One shisha is 200 cigarettes. One shisha is 200 cigarettes. Gotta be, so 20, 20 cigarettes. It's a pack. One, one head is one pack. So if a mother thinks that her lifestyle allows her to do shisha smoking during pregnancy or even after pregnancy or before pregnancy, she's impacting her baby, whether mm -hmm. she knows it or not. How is that happening? How, 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 how smoking affects the baby through the placenta? It affects the placental circulation. Mm -hmm. Toxins in, in, smoking, in, in smoking goes through the placental blood to the baby as well. The baby's the, the placental blood supply is impacted badly, so the blood supply to the to the baby to the to the to the fetus is also impacted, and so on and so forth. Perfect. So that's uh, actually it's interesting to know this. Uh, let's say this complexity behind the uh, uh, disease. Uh, uh, so I think we have maybe one final question before we go to the to the last part. I think we have like interesting discussion. We might uh, go on for another one hour. <laughs> Um, um, so I think, um, okay. Do you have some patients on the biological therapy, uh, uh, amolizumab? If yes, how it's effective? Treat, how is it effective in Qatar? Uh, I used to have a couple of a few patients on amolizumab. Uh, of the, there was a a couple who did very well, and few that didn't do it so well. Uh, I currently don't have anybody on omalizumab, but I have uh, uh, three to four patients on dupilumab. Okay, perfect. So uh, I think we are uh, towards the end of this uh, very interactive and fruitful discussion and uh, session. So thank you so much, Dr. Janahi, for accepting our invitation and for your time and uh, for this very informative presentation. Uh, it's pleasure. a our pleasure to have you today with us. And now before uh, uh, for the audience, uh, we would like to share with you some questions if uh, you can answer them. Uh, these questions are covered during the today's presentation. So the first question about the precipitating factor in asthma exacerbation. So shall they, they type their answers in the chat? Please just add your answer to the chat. Yes, please. Can you type your answer uh, in the chat box? So, which of the following precipitating, precipitating factor for asthma exacerbation in children? Is it lower respiratory tract infection, exercise, cold weather, A and B, or B and C? So, we have C. We have some, D. Uh, some participants are saying D. Yeah, D. We have D. Yeah, so majority of answer are D, which is correct. So in children with wheezing and cough, a partial response to bronchodilator confirms asthma diagnosis. Is it true or false? True. Okay, we have A. Uh, is it A you mean true or because here we I think we have A for both. Um, so maybe Dr. Janahi would like to comment. I don't think every any response to part to bronchodilator means asthma, right? No, of course not. Yeah. Just yeah. mean there is reversibility. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so we can go to the next question. 
five. Which of the following statement is correct regarding moderate persistent stable asthma in children? Is it A, B, C, or D? Taking into consideration symptoms and the BF, BEF. So we have B, we have D. Okay. So we have, um, okay, majority of answers are D. D, C, we have C. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so the correct answer is, is B. They have uh, nocturial symptoms. Uh, um, more than one time per week and BS yes. uh, is 60 to 80 percent reducted. So the others are either um, like completely incorrect or uh, they are referring to other uh, category. For the next question, okay. A normal or high FEV1 in patient with frequent respiratory symptoms confirms asthma diagnosis. Is it true or false? A or B? B, okay. So it's false. False. Perfect. Perfect. So all are correct answers. Yes. So let's go to the final question. Yeah. So in a seven year old child with asthma with moderate control and step three, which of the following treatment strategies is the most appropriate controller therapy? Is it combination therapy? Is it monotherapy? So we have uh, we have B, okay. We have D, okay. We have another B. Uh, we have A, and we have another B. Uh, so the other, the correct answer is uh, B because this is like um, a low dose um, uh, corticosteroid. We should use low dose, not a uh, high dose corticosteroid in this step. So the majority of answers are correct. Okay, so uh, I guess last thing is to thank you once again, uh, Professor Janahi. Thank you for an interactive presentation and thank you as well, uh, Dr. Mona, for moderating uh, the event in uh, such an interactive way and involving the audience. Thank you to everybody for attending this evening, and we look forward to welcoming you back uh, next week for antimicrobial stewardship. To claim your certificate for today, please visit the website, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very good, much. Good night. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you.